All right, let's jump into our lesson now. We'll have some prayer time afterwards. But we are in Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs 27. This is one of those Proverbs that seems like every verse has its own, you know, they're all just separate separate thoughts, and it gets a little bit hard to make a connection between them all, which, which I never intended to do that. Just if, if it's only one or two verses, we'll just go off of that. But, uh, but I did, I did kind of see a theme here between verse one, and, uh, 1 through 6. And so let's read those, and then we'll get into to it. Uh, Proverbs, Proverbs 27, 1 through 6. Boast not thyself of tomorrow... For thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. A stone is heavy and sand weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. Wrath is cruel, and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend." but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The more I read this and started thinking about it, I see a little bit of a, um, a digression, if you will. And in the, uh, <clears throat> in, throughout the Bible, there's a lot of lists that seem to be kind of a downward spiral. Uh, the one that jumps in my mind right away is, is Psalm 1 that says... Uh, uh, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So you got a man who's walking in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. He stops walking, now he's just standing. Uh, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Did I miss one? Anyway, you see that downward, he's walking and then he stops and then he's sitting and then he's just a scornful person, right? Well, what I think that we see here in this list is kind of a downward spiral of what happens to somebody who's blinded by pride. And so the title uh, tonight, Proverbs 27, Blinded by Pride. And we've got a list of things here. There's six, six different steps, if you will, that I see here. First of all, obvious, the, that first one, Boast not yourself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. The first... Uh, Step, I think, in this downward spiral is thinking you are in control of your own life. Now, that's pretty simple for us all to do. Uh, I get wrapped up in that too. And, and you know, I, I often have I've told people, now I'm looking ahead and I got a five year plan and, and I'm trying to write down what I want to accomplish in the next five years. But I've got to remember that I can't actually think that I know what's going to happen in the next five years, right? That would be prideful because. There's no way we can know. We are not in control of everything in our life. I mean, God wants us to make plans. There's nothing wrong with that, but we must admit we're not in complete control. Uh, look at James chapter 4 real quick. James chapter 4. Very familiar passage here. In verse... Uh, Starting in verse 13. <clears throat> go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go in such a uh, city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. When you really think about that and you, when you can really grasp that reality that we're only on this earth such a short amount of time, and there's only so much that we can accomplish, but, uh, uh, so we can make all the plans and everything we want, but we really don't know what tomorrow holds. Okay, Verse 15, For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. So the Bible says it's evil. If you boast yourself and say, this is what we're going to do. And you've seen the kind of people, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to take over this. And we're going <laughs> to, I don't know why I always get political, but I started, I started to say, we're going to build a wall. <laughs> that idea, you know, 
This is why we try to adopt that phrase, Lord willing, right? Lord willing, we'll do this and that. You don't want to just say it in vanity, but certainly when we really think about the fact that, you know, I mean, Lord willing, I'm going to take my next breath, you know, Lord willing, I'm going to go to bed, bed tonight. We don't have to say that, you know, every time we do something, but I think that attitude and that, that knowledge in our mind and in our heart that, that this isn't our, I mean, this is our life to some degree, but, but God is in control and he, he's the one that decides what we get to do and what we don't get to do. So plans are fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with making plans, but we, the first step in the downward spiral is thinking that you are in control of your own life. The second is this, the feeling, the need for praise. Verse two, let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. I think that's probably one of the biggest things in our society right now is this, especially with young people, is just this desire to just be praised for everything they do. And we are in what they call the selfie generation. If you don't know what that is, you know, everyone wants to take a picture of themselves and in every situation. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with documenting and having pictures of family and, and things that are going on in your life and sharing them with people. I, I certainly enjoy doing that myself. But we got to be careful that we don't just get to this. You're putting it out there, and it's really bad with ladies on, on social media and everything. And just they're just wanting to strike their best pose and, and show, you know, they probably took like 20 pictures before they finally put one on there. So people would say, wow, you're so beautiful. And, uh, and that's what they want. They want people to say, hey, wow, that is just so great. And I say that about the women because I think that women do desire that. And maybe it's something that uh, they need more, more than men do. But at the same time, you know, men, men, it's not so much with, with looks, though, is the thing. With men, it's the things that we do. <laughs> we want to, I mean, that's just a manly thing. And uh, I've heard lots of jokes about it. I can't think of anything in particular to... Uh, but, but the truth of the matter is a guy, I mean, a woman will, you know, she'll all day long clean the house, take care of the kids, fix this, do that, you know, and, and accomplished all this. And we come through the house and want to tell her about, you know, just one little thing that we did. Hey, I fixed this doorknob. <laughs> Aren't you going to praise me for that? That's just our, our human nature. And that, again, that's just our personalities. And, and that's part of learning each other and knowing how, knowing how we think and, and all, but but women tend to want to get pr praised for the physical. Men send, seem to want to get praised for the, uh, the, you know, what they were able to accomplish or what they did. They kind of want to pat on the back. And again, it, it's not wrong to give praise necessarily or, or to compliment somebody. And it's not wrong to receive a compliment. You just have to, you know, not just be the personality that you're just always craving that. You just always want somebody to tell you how good you did or whatever. But it says this, let another man praise you and not yourself. So there's two things here. Number one, you've got the person that just always wants to talk good about themselves, you know. There's certainly that. You know, all they want to, well, uh, well, I accomplished this and this and this. And under my you know, uh, uh, whatever my reign at, at whatever job it is that they did or whatever, we accomplished this and that. And they just always want to talk about what they did and uh, what they've accomplished or whatever. And so the Bible, there's this principle that goes all throughout it. And Jesus talked a lot about this too. It said, don't try to puff yourself up and say all these good things about you. And so this word of wisdom, remember we're in Proverbs talking about wisdom and this, it's, it's this, let somebody else say that about you, then it's actually a good thing. It's a compliment. But when somebody goes around talking good about themselves all the time, number one, a lot of people aren't going to want to be around you very long. And here's what I found in this generation of everybody wanting compliments. A lot of people will give you the compliment because they feel like that's the right thing to do. But in their heart and in their mind, they're thinking, when will you stop asking for compliments? <laughs> but they'll go ahead and do it. But there's a flip side to this too. Some people... They're still fishing for compliments, but what they, the way that they do it is they always talk bad about themselves. Have you ever met those kinds of people? They're just always like, no, no, I'm just not good at anything. I'm just so terrible. They're looking up like, come on, tell me I'm not. <laughs> you know? 
And if you ever said, yeah, you are, I mean, that would be <laughs> terrible. But, but some, I remember uh, uh, Art Wilson, you know, we talked about him not too long ago with somebody, I can't remember who it was, but in Springfield, uh, he's got started a lot of churches around Kansas. And uh, he was a guy that, uh, Brother Art Wilson, he, he started in his old age, in his 90s, I don't remember how late, how long he lived, but in his 90s, he really couldn't see. He needed someone to take him around. And in fact, one time he preached a whole message, and he would quote like chapters of scripture. And, uh, and he had his Bible up here, and he kept, uh, uh, he went through the entire message. I believe he quoted chapters out of Revelation, if I remember right. And after it was all done, the pastor got up and said, uh, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Your Bible's been upside down this whole time. <laughs> anyway, that's just a memory I have of him. Uh, he just quoted so much scripture, very wise man. So I got the opportunity when I was in Springfield to pick him up and take him to work every day to his office. I'd kind of get him there and help him in. Uh, you know, He had a machine where he could look. It was a big magnifying glass and he could read his Bible and stuff uh, and study, read books. And he wrote a lot of books too. But anyway... Uh, uh, we developed a relationship where he'd joke around and stuff, but, uh, but I always would come, I'm, I'm so sorry, brother. Will. I'm sorry. And he's like, I know you are. Now, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I know you're sorry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, things like that. But anyway, a few people can get away with doing those kinds of things. But, <laughs> but sometimes we do. We just want to always like, no, 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 I'm sorry. And the same thing. Ladies who are used often fishing for compliments about their looks or whatever, I'd be like, I'm so ugly. I just, you know, want to. What they're wanting somebody to say is, no, you're not. You're beautiful. You hold your head up and you do that. And again, I, I'm not saying it's wrong to pay someone a compliment or help their uh, self esteem a little bit or whatever, but we just got to be careful what, that we're not fishing for compliments all the time, you know. And, uh, and, and I could probably preach another message on, on why it's a good thing to give people compliments sometimes, but, but we just got to be careful. It's a downward spiral of pride, okay? First, we think we're in control of our life, and then we find this need for somebody to praise us, you know. The Bible says, Matthew 23, uh, 11 and 13, Jesus said, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. And so uh, if you really do want to rise to a level of respect in something that is, is worthy of praise or whatever, you have to humble yourself, but not because you're fishing for compliment. <laughs> God will love to give you the position of honor that you deserve, but you can't see what he has for you when you're, when you're focused on getting all your focus is on compliments and then you're actually blinded uh, by your pride, which will take you to another downward, uh, another uh, level of this downward spiral. And that's verse three. We see a stone is heavy and sand weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. When you're around somebody who's just so easily angry, um, it's uncomfortable for everybody. I was just on the way up here. I was, I almost ran out of gas. And I, between uh, Fort Scott and Moran, I was on empty. And I was thinking, oh, Lord, please help me. And it was ding, ding. And that's when I realized. But I made it to Moran. And I stopped to get gas. And while I was filling up, this couple obviously had some kind of relationship in the past or whatever. Maybe they're exes. I don't know. But came out of the gas station. And all of a sudden, there's yelling. And they're shouting. And they're cussing at each other. And the words are getting more and more vulgar and louder and louder. And I'm looking around. There's people on all the gas stations. It's not like they're in private. And I'm thinking, have you no respect? I mean, and there's even kids around, you know, and they're cussing these profanity. And it's just this. I thought somebody, I think one of the ladies, I think it was her mother, maybe, got out of the car, went up to the guy, like got in his face. And I thought, she's going to get punched, you know, and I'm going to have to do something. <laughs> you know, It's just uncomfortable. And everybody was. And you could feel it after he peeled off in his truck and she said her last little profanities and got in the car. Everybody's like, Whew. I mean, it was just like the whole time. It's like, because it's, it's awkward and it makes you feel weird. And, you know, I'll be in here studying uh, uh, quite often. I told you about one guy that walked down and just yelled whenever he read the sign. But sometimes it's couples that'll be walking down here just yelling profanity. And by the way, the ladies usually have the worst mouth. <laughs> the ladies, it's usually like, <laughs> 
what they used to say to make a, a sailor blush. You know, some of those ladies are kind of creative with their language. <laughs> but, uh, but, it's, but here's what that is. It's pride, you know, anger, wrath, flying off, just no control of your wrath. What, what is the source of that? Where does it come from? It's pride. Your feelings got hurt and you can't control it. Or you didn't get what you want and you can't control it. And, and it's just this, this uh, it's, a, it's a next level in the downward spiral where you just get angry. And many times what a person is angry about, oftentimes it's not really that big of a deal. When, you know, later on, after everything unfolds, it wasn't that big of a deal. They just, it just got under their skin and it made them mad. And it's usually not, uh, not even that big. You know, I remember growing up, uh, the counsel that they'd give you, and probably they still do, is, is take a deep breath, count to 10, <laughs> you know, relax. If you can settle down and let it pass for a little while, then it's probably going to go away rather than just uh, blowing up and... and uh, and doing that. Proverbs 18, 13 says this, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So the idea is if you're going to not let your pride get in the way, then you'll be able to, to think through a situation and say, you know, it's probably not going to help the situation for me to just start getting mad. Or, you know, if I cuss at that person, they're probably going to cuss back at me even louder. And that's just going to start a big fight. I mean, you shouldn't cuss anyway, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> if, you, if I start getting mad at them or saying something negative, it just becomes a big battle. Why, why not try to avoid that? Now, there's a time to stand up. There's a time, I believe, for righteous anger. You know, It's usually not fly off the handle mad, but there's a time to get angry uh, for the right reason. The Bible says be angry and sin not. There's a time to be angry, but there's a right way to do it and to handle it. Uh, 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 for instance, the uh, Bible says not to go. Uh, I, I, I don't remember what, how the verse goes in the Bible. I, should, I, should, I didn't think about reading that. There's a, a policy that I've tried to develop that was based off of this, but I can't remember. It's about, oh, let, let not the sun go down upon thy wrath. That's what it is. So there's a policy I developed that said, okay, let's say my wife and I are having, believe it or not, there might be a time or two where we're upset with each other. <laughs> and that's usually you'll be able to tell because she's not talking to me. She's not yelling at me if she's mad. If she's yelling at me, oh, everything's okay. If she's not talking to me, we're, <laughs> we're mad. She's giving me the look, but she knows it's true. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, uh, but I try to make this policy, okay, resolve it before you go to sleep. There's no reason to leave it there until morning, let it fester and fester and everything. So there's, a, you know, being angry isn't necessarily wrong. It's how you deal with it and where it goes from there. But but it usually is the fruit. It, it usually bears fruit of some bad actions. And so, and so uh, uh, anyway, all pride. It just comes down to pride, and we're blinded by our pride, and so we 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 don't take the time to think and to control our actions. Number four is uh, wanting what somebody else has. Now, it just said in verse 3 that a stone is heavy and sand is weightier, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. But verse 4 goes like this. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. It's just thinking like anger, like anger and wrath, these are the worst things. But look, it says, but who is able to stand before envy? You know, and I don't know what side it's talking about. Like, is it, if... If I'm the one that's envious, it's going to mess me up, for one thing. But if somebody's envious of you, that's real weighty, too. You know, um, it just causes, and it's, it's just, that's one of the biggest things, uh, uh, evidences of somebody who's in pride, right? I mean, that makes sense. You're pride, and you want what somebody else has. And so there's this envious, and it says, who can stand against envy? It's heavier than wrath, even. We don't typically think that. We think wrath would be like one of the greatest expressions because they're blowing up and they're getting mad and they're yelling and they're doing all this. But you know, somebody who's envious, oftentimes they might not yell. Sometimes they'll yell too. But a lot of times it becomes this kind of uh, trying, to, trying to destroy somebody from underneath, you know, or from behind their back or secretly because they, they're just so consumed with this idea of, uh, of I don't like this person and I don't like what they've got, and I don't like why they got a promotion, I didn't get a promotion, or whatever it is that causes envy. Very, very terrible thing, a weighty, a heavier thing. 
Uh, when people are envious of what others have, they're blinded to what they, to what they have. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't think of, of, of an example, but let's say you saw somebody with, uh, they got a nice new car, and your car's not running real good, and you say, oh, that's just, why do they get, that's just not right for them to get that kind of car. When, when you don't stop and think about the fact that your car is working just fine or, or you have this other thing that they don't have or, or you, there's so many things that if you just look, what's that song say? Count your blessings, name them one by one. It'll surprise you what the Lord has done. When you focus on what you have, you know, you think about all the things God's blessed you with, you don't have time to sit there and worry about what somebody else has and, and to let it just rise. It's just pride and people blinded by the pride. Uh, let's see here. The fifth thing would be this. Verse 5 and the first half of verse 6 says this. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Now, we, we don't like rebuke, naturally. I don't think anybody likes rebuke. <laughs> you know? But if you have a friend that comes to you and nobody can do it better than a really close friend, actually. If you have a friend that comes to you and tells you that what you're doing is wrong or that you ought to do it this way, or they, and they do it in the right spirit and they're helping you, it can change your life because you realize, hey, that person loved me. They're willing to tell me that what I'm doing is damaging myself or hurting myself. And you could actually grow and, uh, and, and, get, and improve so much more on, on whatever it's wrong in your life. But so many times we get this attitude that it's wrong to rebuke somebody. It's wrong to tell. You should just always say nice things. And what you're doing is harming them because you're just letting them, you know, continue in sin or letting them hurt themselves or letting them do whatever. So, so the words of a friend, or how does it say the, uh, uh, the uh, wounds of a friend? I mean, they, they can say something and, it's, and it kind of it hurts, Right, because they said it, and you know that saying that the truth hurts. I tell you the truth, and it hurts. It's it's a wound. The the but faithful are the wounds of the friends. Uh, open rebuke is better than secret love. Right? They might love you, but you never you never see them do anything about it. But but uh, but whenever they love you, and they and they just op they'll openly rebuke you, and it hurts. But it's actually that they love you. Now, so how does that? What does that have to do with this downward spiral? Well. I believe that you get to a point, okay, and even if these aren't an exact downward spiral, I'm not saying that necessarily the Holy Spirit intended for us to look at it that way, but I definitely think it's true that these things happen when you allow your pride to control your life. You, don't, you start to think that you're in control of your own life, and then you feel a need for people to praise you. You get angry when, you don't ha when things don't go your way. You start wanting what other people have. Now, here's the last one. You don't listen to any form of rebuke, okay? That's the fifth, uh, fifth thing here. You won't listen to any form of rebuke. It's interesting that this, uh, le that this lesson is tonight because tomorrow, Valerie and I have the opportunity to teach a little lesson at the, at the camp. Uh, what they do is, is in the morning, they have a Bible uh, time of where they do their pri private devotions, well, let's see, they go to the flagpole, then they go eat, then they do their private devotions, and then they split up, boys and girls, and they have somebody, uh, usually a pastor in the, in the, involved in the camp or whatever, and they will then split up boy session, girl session, then they come back. I mean, there's a lot of preaching that goes on. <laughs> I told uh, 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 Riley this morning, he woke up and said, we got to go to church again <laughs> or something like that, and I said, well, Riley, it's a church camp, so you got to go to church. If it was basketball camp, you'd have to play basketball every day. <laughs> if it was Boy Scout camp, you'd have to go play whatever Boy Scouts do every day. It's church camp. And so uh, anyway, so there's a lot of preaching. But we're going to uh, uh, preach in the morning. She's going to speak to the girls, and I'm going to speak to the boys on the idea of focus. And, you know, I don't know exactly where she's going with, with her lesson, but in my lesson, one of the things I wanted to talk about how we get blinded 
you know, uh, Second Peter talks about if you don't have these things that God wants you to have in your Christian life so that you can enter into life abundantly, it says. And, and so he gives you all these things. It says if you don't have those, you're blinded and you can't see afar off. And so the title of this lesson is Blinded by Pride, and it kind of goes together. So I want to share this story that I'm going to share with the kids tomorrow. But there was this kid in, uh, in Oklahoma City when we worked on the buses. He, he was on our bus route. And he was pretty faithful. He would come all the time. Uh, but he would always tell me, oh, yeah, I hate my dad. He's so mean. And he beats me. And we'd go talk to uh, Reginald's dad. He was from Ghana, West Africa. And so he had a really deep accent. This boy, I don't know what to do with this boy. <laughs> He's killing me. And, uh, and so we'd talk a little bit about it. And he said, I spanked him because I thought that was the only thing I could do. And, and then the school came and said, you got it, you get, you're beating him. We're going to take, we'll take him away from you if you keep doing that. And so, uh, so but, you know, Reginald, oh, yeah, he beats me, he beats me. And I was like, Reginald, I, I, I'm not saying it's, so, it's good for a parent to beat a child and all that. I'm not trying to say that, but I don't understand. If, if you're afraid that your dad's going to beat you, why do you keep doing the things <laughs> that you're getting beat for? I mean, that... This is, to me, just common sense, right? Because they were dumb things, stealing. I mean, he was doing wrong things and deserved to be spanked. <laughs> but he was doing dumb things, and they just didn't think it was fair for his dad to be. I said, why do you keep doing those things if you don't want to get spanked for them? But the, isn't that so true? That's how, that's how kid, kids are, and really a, adults are too. <laughs> you know, you already went to jail for that. Why are you going to do it again? You know you're going go to go to jail. You know, you know... Uh, this destroyed your first marriage. You're in your second marriage. Why are you going to do the same thing over again? And the idea is that because people are blinded by their pride, they won't listen to rebuke. They don't even see uh, what's coming ahead. It, so one time in our devotions, and we've read this verse, who knows how many times in the past, I'm sure, but, but in our devotions, our family read this going, when we were going through Proverbs and uh, if you look at in our text at verse 22, it's not in our little, our actual text, verse 1 through 6 that we're going through, but, but this is where we read this, and it became kind of our family's favorite verse. Though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar among wheat with a pestle, yet will his foolishness, yet not, <laughs> will not his foolishness depart from him. Well, on our counter in our house, we've got this thing as stone. And it's like a stone bowl. And then there's another piece of stone that's just a really big, it's a pestle. <laughs> I don't know any, uh, what else to call it. But it just, and they're super heavy. And what you do is you put your wheat in there or whatever you're going to mash up. Uh, I make hummus in there sometimes, whatever. And you just put it in there and you just start bashing it <laughs> until it just goes. And so you get this picture of it. You know, if you th put him in a, and a mortar, which is the name for the bowl, with the wheat, and beat him with a pestle, yet will not he hear a rebuke. Because somebody is so blinded by their own pride and what they want. And, you know, and I often read, and we've made reference to many times about how somebody gets to a point where they've got what is called a reprobate mind. And they just, there's nothing you can do. You can, I mean, I'm not saying don't try. Go ahead and give the gospel. Go ahead and try to, you know, discipline them or whatever. But it's like they're like almost like sociopaths and they don't, there's like nothing's getting through to them. And uh, what a terrible place to be. But it's true. People get to that point and there's like nothing you can do. And so that's why I say, you know, what we, all, all we can do as a nation as far as governing, governing ourselves is just discipline the actions and not give everyone excuses and stuff like that. But if you did the crime, you do the time, you pay for, you know, whatever, whatever you did. And, uh, and so, there, because how do you treat somebody like that? You know, uh, there, I believe that reform can happen. You know, we we're just talking about, uh, uh, by the way, I got to make that announcement later on. Yeah, I got to make that announcement later on. But anyway, talking about her grandson, Marshall, and, and how he was in uh, jail doing some time, but they're, they're working on reforming him. I believe that happens. I'm not saying it doesn't or that we shouldn't try to do that. But there are some people in the, in the jail system that have never really paid the price. They just simply sit in the cell, get fed three square meals a day. They get what they want in many ways. 
There are some people that want to go to jail because it's better than the situation that they're in. And then they come out and it's like they just want to go right back into jail. And, and so, uh, uh, so anyway, it's because their mind just, it's gone. They're going to do what they want to do. And that's a, when you get to that point, you're down at the bottom. It's pride is taking you to the, one of the lowest spots that it can go. But there's one more in our text that I want to look at, and that is becoming the enemy who will not listen to reason. Okay, and uh, uh, let me see here. Uh, what did I say? Verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And, and the problem with that is sometimes you don't even know when a person's gotten to this point. Uh, you don't know. I mean, there might be little signs. There might be little clues. But you don't know when a person has got to become to that point where they're the enemy. You know, and, and so you got to be careful. The kisses, uh, uh, their kisses could even be deceiving. And, uh, and you, can't, you can't trust them. I don't, I'm not saying you got to go around looking for who that person is. I'm just saying beware because when somebody gets to that point, where they're that bad, they won't listen to any reason, and they're just selfish, and they get angry, and they do all these things. You really don't know, but they might very well be your enemy, <laughs> you know, trying to destroy you because the, they've, got, they've reached that ultimate low. So pride, and, and you know, pretty much all sin is, comes down to pride, you know. In fact, the Bible says what, the, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, someone that loves money, that's pride. They want more money so they can buy more stuff that they want or whatever. It's just, it all comes down to pride. Thinking about themselves, putting themselves above other people and above God. And once somebody begins down that road, it just goes down farther and farther and farther. So the way to avoid that is just go back to verse 1. Boast not yourself of tomorrow. <laughs> you don't know what a day brings forth. Always say, if the Lord will, I'll do this, you know. If he doesn't want me to do that, I won't do it. What does the Bible say? Let's look at what the Bible says. And so, uh, so that is the answer to keep us out of such trouble. So, All right. Uh, Valerie, why don't you come forward?